you'll be introducing our speaker? Yes, I'm delighted yeah, please. to. Take it on. Thank you, Elias. Um, I'm delighted to introduce my good friend, Barbara Adler. Uh, Barbara is still camped out in Florida, but she is a Brookline person. And I've uh, had the pleasure of knowing her now for several years. I met her through Congregation Kehillah Israel, and we're both in the same um, book club. So we meet with a professional women's book club once a month, which is always fun. And Barbara and I have had similar journeys uh, through the technology world uh, as women of our age uh, all have sort of similar experiences. But uh, Barbara is a particularly good speaker and I thought you would enjoy hearing about her own perspective on women in technology. So well right. Thank you, Joyce. I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but um, you need to know a couple of things first. One, Joyce is a far better technologist than I am. I'm much more excitable, and, and you'll see as the presentation winds around, um, she's, she's far, far calmer and normal than I am. As a speaker, I prepared some photographs and things for you to look at, but because we're a small group, feel free to ask anything or interrupt at any point because I can talk for hours uh, and you don't want to listen to that. So feel free to, to ask any questions or whatever you'd like. I'm going to put up my screen. And as you can see, I'm going to talk about women in technology. Okay. And see, I spelled everything correctly, which proves I'm a great technologist. Um, however, as Joyce said, we are, Joyce and I are very, very lucky because the idea of women in technology during our lifetime and our career time has exploded. And let's, let's start with making sure that we're talking about the same things. You know, science explores new knowledge through observation and experiments. It's very rigorous. But technology is the application of the scientific knowledge for various purposes. And there, as you can see from this slide, um, really technology is far more interesting if you want to know the truth. Um, it's, less, it's less rigorous and more rigorous at the same time. Here is uh, a slide of the moon landing control room in 1969. Notice the arrow. You can see what it is. She was it. Her name is Robin, Robin Morgan. And she was the sole female in this, in this, in 1969. And we were all alive then. I mean, this was it. Now, I'm going to play you a little video of people hugging each other and screaming. Nominal altitude error, 5.9 years. We found a nice 
So you can see things have changed, but interestingly, I found this piece. Um, Swati Mohan who, um, was explaining what the, the, the motion, what the, the rover is going to do. And she's the lead. She is the lead. And that I found to be very interesting in addition to the people screaming, yelling, and, and generally carrying on. So women in technology in the last 50 years, they've really had, we've had like this explosion. And I wanted to introduce you to um, six favorites and there are many, many, many more, but you'll notice that from the dates, they're during, most of them are during our lifetimes. Except for Ada Lovelace, who I admire, and I'll show you why in a moment. Ada, Ada Lovelace looked like this, and obviously she was a pretty woman. Um, but what she did was she said, she figured out how an, an, the analytical uh, engine would work. She was a mathematician. And the idea is you can, it can do whatever we know how to do. It can, it, it can, it can follow analysis, but it, it can't anticipate anything. And it's, it's provinces to assist us in making um, clear things that we are already acquainted with. In other words, it speeds things up, but it's, it doesn't anticipate anything. And she is, is, uh, recognized as the as the first computer programmer because she really understood what a program is and in many ways what a computer is even though she'd never seen one and couldn't couldn't think about it. Okay, we'll go to Edith Clark and Edith. I like Edith Clark because she looks like my mother. I mean, she looks like your mother. Um, she was the first woman to earn a master's degree in electrical engineering, but nobody would hire her. So she went to Istanbul who would hire her to teach, but she felt wasted. So she came back as a, a human computer for General Electric. And what she did was to figure out how to send power through the electrical lines and basically made transcontinental telephone communication possible. And what I also like about her is that she became the first professional female electrical engineer. And she looks like your mother, my mother, or anybody. This is, this is what, you know, Saint, Saint Grace, frankly, um, except she wasn't, her personality was not like Saint-like. She was more crisp, but she, she was the queen of software. She, she during her, her, her career, I might add, she was a naval admiral. She worked, with, she, um, worked on UNIVAC 1, which was the first commercial computer, and she created the first compiler. And this is a picture of her in her, I guess, mid-years. Later, she was a little kind of squashed, very... Um, officer-like admiral because she was in, in the, for the Navy, because the Navy became, was the, were the ones who developed computers. Um, and she invented Flomatic, which helped spark the development of COBOL, which was the, the Navy's standard operating language and later became the programming language of business. Uh, Joyce actually knew Grace Hopper. She met her. And again, we were very lucky that in our lifetime, we met amazing people. This is Radia Perlman. And Radia Perlman is probably 70 now. So you, she's a nice lady. She looks like every other nice lady. But she's smart. And she, what she did made it possible for the internet to exist. I mean, her idea about the, the STP 
made it possible for you to, to have an internet from my bill, well, to talk to you. I could, I'm in Florida. If we didn't have the internet, wouldn't happen. Um, and she's, you know, she's still here and she looks like everybody's, um, every, everybody else. This is a lady that is no longer here, um, but she was the first <coughs> person, that, that she and Irving Tang were the first persons to earn a doctorate in computer science in the United States. And the, the interesting thing is we don't, we don't think about be pe people in the religious life as ha being able to be technologists, but of course they can. Um, it doesn't stop you and it might help you concentrate. Um, but she certainly, I, I like her very much because she had that attitude. You know, being in the religious life doesn't mean that you cannot be a mathematician and that you cannot figure out how computers work. Um, I thought I, I like her particularly. And then I'm going to show you Catherine Coleman Goebel Johnson, who you may recognize. If you saw the movie Hidden Figures, here she is. This is the real Catherine Johnson, the real computer lady, the real, the human computer. And in Hidden Figures, you'll see she, she is shown as being um, calculating trajectories, launch windows, and when, when the computing group couldn't do it, she could do it. And she, you know, did it on the fly when it was desperate and the machine couldn't do it properly. She did it and she gave them the, the correct tra trajectories and insertion points for the, for the John Glenn, for the Apollo lunar module. And, you know, she unfortunately died last, last year, but she, was, she worked on plans for missions to Mars and she and her contemporaries did fantastic things, just fantastic things. And if you have not seen Hidden Figures, please um, make it a point to do that because um, it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. I wanted this, these people are in here, you've never heard of them. And it comes back to something you were talking about earlier in the meeting. Um, people who did not get the credit that they should have. This is one of the groups that, um, of women who got no credit at all, okay? And in fact, their male supervisor took all of the credit and in the press releases that were, that were issued. But the day before this thing was supposed to be um, shown to the public, it didn't work. It didn't work because, and it was you know, a $400,000 computer, which in today's dollars is about $3 million, but it didn't work. It didn't, it didn't work, it just stayed there. And these ladies, every one of them, um, stayed and figured out how to make it work in the nick of time. And they are my heroines because they know that clenching feeling in the pit of your stomach when you need to have it working by some arbitrary deadline and it doesn't. And I, I want to show you what they were working with. This, it was a room sized computer with 80,000 vacuum uh, tubes and hand soldered connections and it didn't work. Something was wrong with one of the vacuum tubes or one of the connections, but whatever it was wrong with it, it didn't work. And it had to work because the press was coming and all the dignitaries were coming to watch this thing calculate ballistic trajectories quickly because if it's working, if it was going to work, it could uh, calculate a trajectory. This is World War II, mind you. Um, when in 20 seconds, but of course it didn't work. So they got to stay up all night 
testing all of these relays and all of these tubes. Susan, I see you. Barbara, what was their role in the organization? Why were these women there that night to, or asked they, to stay? They were called, essentially, they were just the crew that was, that was putting these things together. I mean, putting in the vacuum tubes, making sure the wires were properly connected. They got no credit as programmers or anything else. They were just, you know, they could, they, once they understood how it was supposed to work, they had to wire it so that it would follow, the logic would follow those paths and that the vacuum tubes would all fire at the right time and that they would not be broken. And they did it. I mean, they were not acknowledged as quote programmers or anything else. And if you look at the, the PR that was issued the next day, their male supervisor took all the credit because he was a wonderful man and, and he knew just how to do it. They didn't use it in World War II much because it was so, you know, it was an on and off thing. Sometimes it would do it great. Sometimes it would do it badly and you couldn't depend on it. And the war was at beginning to end by the time they needed it. But it was used later to calculate some things about was an atom bomb possible? And it was used. So I bring you to the 1970s. In 1970s, computer rooms look pretty much like this, tape drives. Um, and you, the data was on a tape and the program was on a tape, the instructions were on a tape and you ha had to hang them at the right points. And if you did, theoretically, the answer would come out in reams of computer paper, which you can't see a printer here, but there is one, and which would fall all over the floor, and that would be what it looked like. So I got into it. Why? I was teaching. I was teaching science. Um, there was an ad. It said, teachers, are you tired of the classroom? Would you like to try new technology? We will pay for you to go to computer school if you will work for us for three weeks, for three years. I was tired of teaching junior high school. Um, my own kids were taking as much patience as I had. I didn't have a lot by the end of the day. So I answered the ad. And in those, in 19, late 70s, you remember there were no computer science majors because there's no computer science department because they have desperately short of programmers and you had to come through a math department. And not everybody wants to be a mathematician. Some can, some can't. Frankly, I'm a can't. But at any rate, so I went and I... Um, uh, I answered the ad and I, this nice man explained to me what Ada Lovelace had figured out, which is computers cannot take the next step. They don't analyze anything and they don't think for themselves in any way. You have to tell it exactly what to do. And if you don't, it stops. And if you tell it to do something either physiologically or anatomically impossible, it stops. And you have, so you have to understand every step in the process before you can program a computer or ask it to do anything. At any rate, um, however, it was kind of intriguing. I have to say that there was nobody it was nothing happening that wasn't intriguing. So I went to computer school. And may I just say that it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I already had several um, graduate degrees. It's much harder than going to graduate school because you went, programming is really about thinking about things correctly. Once you can think about it correctly, the rest is just details in, in many ways. Um, but I did go to computer school and we did, remember this was 
old timey. We didn't even have a compiler that you could do online the way we do today. You had to write out your program on cardstock. You punched cardstock, one card at a time, and you numbered it. And then when you'd written your whole program of what to do, you dropped it in a card reader, a compiler, would read it and say to you, wrong, and give you your card back, give you your cards back. It would not have the decency to tell you what was wrong with it. No, it just said this won't work and gave it back. Uh, very tedious. <clears throat> and if you drop the deck of cards, I hope you numbered them because there could be 900 cards in your deck. Um, programming was in its very early stages then. And so, um, an online editor later was just, the, the, when you can just go and type in the instructions on the screen, you don't realize how much labor you are saving. Just, just like that. I mean, just looking at it, um, it saves it. The, 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 the online editors are fabulous. They tell you, well, this ain't gonna work. And which comes to what does work. These, um, I worked a lot of different places and as like, jo perhaps like Joyce, I'm less a pure technologist than a problem solver. And I like to solve business problems. That's what I like to do. So what business problems do these things uh, all have the same? An aquarium, a can of baked beans and a can of paint. Well, it, it's amazing. They have a lot of commonality because computers can tell you what materials do I need to make it? Either an aquarium, a can of beans, or a can of paint. How much shall I make? That's inventory management. You know, do you have some in the warehouse? Do you need more? Do you need less? I used to work for an international paint company. They paint battleships. You can't really be three cans of paint short. They get very upset. I mean, they get really, really, really upset. And it has to be the right color. And it has to be in the place that it's, they're painting the ship. And a lot of things like that. So it's, computers are good. Where should I distribute it? The beans. Um, I used to work for ShopRite supermarkets. And supermarkets are uh, supplied out of giant warehouses. So the question is, where is this inventory? Where should I move it to? When should I move it? If, um, if I move it, if it's a perishable, if you bring in too much milk and you can't distribute it, some of the milk will be spoiled and have to be dumped because it will spoil. If you bring in too much frozen food and you don't have enough room in the freezers, then um, you know some of it will either melt or have to be sent somewhere else. So it, you're playing with a lot of money and a lot of people's patience because in the end, you and I want to go get our beans at the supermarket. You don't want an empty shelf to, to get your beans and you want it to be there just in time. You know, you don't want them to store beans for eight months so that you can walk in and say, yes, I want those beans. Um, it's a lot of figuring out when they should be uh, shipped and when they should be received. And I don't know, here in Florida, there are huge distribution centers. I'm sure there are some in Massachusetts. I don't happen to know where they are, though. I know Amazon has a couple. But the idea is in a distribution center, trucks, waves of trucks roll up at roughly every half hour to say 23 doors. By those 23 doors have to be all the, the pallets of goods for a given, a given um, distribution point. They have to be ready and waiting because they have to be loaded on the trucks as fast as possible. And the truck wants to leave to go to distribute. And the next set of trucks 
is going to move in. Um, you, they, you have half an hour to produce a pick ticket and the right amount of, of stuff on the pallets that goes to the right destinations in time. It's very, um, I find it extremely interesting work. Not everybody does, but I think that is such an interesting thing. And I think often of the, the truck driver in my early career, when the computer had stopped, who said, to, who came to visit me in the office, he had a big submarine sandwich, he had the New York Post, he had, a, and, and I was losing my mind because the computer did not computer anything. And the trucks are waiting outside. And he said, honey, don't worry, I'm union. I'm gonna sit right here and eat my sandwich. And when you figure it out, just let me know, I'll go back in the truck. And there were 23 others and 30 on their way. It, it could be very tense making. Um, but it was, it was I, en I enjoyed logistics a lot. And the other question that um, all computers often are asked to answer is, where's my money? Um, either the, the business wants their books kept or um, you can, you can keep track of people's money purely in as financial applications. And I say this because I worked for Merrill Lynch for many years. And if you had a 401k during those years, every night we valued every single one of your trades and got your stuff moved from account, wherever you bought it to your account or from your account to somewhere else. And then we valued your account. And it's just so that you in the morning can go on the computer and say, where's my money? And it will be right. And it will be settled. And you need to know. And you're not going to accept any excuses about, we don't know, it didn't settle. Where's my money is a really good question. Um, a really, really good question. So now... Everybody in technology has some things that are in common. Most of the time, the programs don't work. Otherwise, they don't need you. I mean, you have to figure it out and then you have to make it work. But most of 80%, 98% of the time, it doesn't work. That's why you're there. You will learn to curse like a sailor. Um, usually, you start, at the, I start, at the, um, Joyce's. Uh, process may be a little different. I start by asking the program, what's wrong with you? How do you feel about this? And then I move on to what is wrong with you? And then I move on to what is wrong with you? And then I move on to what is wrong with you? And then the language disintegrates. <laughs> now, some people have other methods. I'm not sure of Joyce's. I had a friend who would sing opera as she worked on these things. And if she was moving from lovely little country melodies, it would be fine. And then it would get a little louder. And if she was doing Pagliacci, if she's moving into Wagner, you've got real problems. And it, the louder it got, you knew that it was bad. But everybody has their own technology and their own technique. Um, the reason they're called bugs, because they're really annoying and you don't know where they're going to be and you have to debug everything. And then if, after great effort, your program works, you have tested it, you have done everything, the client will immediately want something else and the program has to be changed immediately. And that's, that's the nature of what they do. Um, this is, and the other thing is you will learn to drink lots and lots and lots of coffee. It's good for your brain and theoretically it'll keep you up and maybe you'll have an idea, who knows. Um, in women in technology have some special, special hazards. We tend to speak in a lighter voice so that if, they, if it's a noisy meeting, they can't hear you. Really, they, they're all yelling. They often can't hear you. 
you have to work it out how to be heard. You'll often be confused with the coffee lady. And people, as you walk into unknown spaces, people will ask you for muffins and coffee. It's just a thing. Um, however, you know, I know, I know women engineers who used to wear hard hats in buildings just so they wouldn't be confused with the coffee lady. Um, you will often have childcare responsibilities and the nursery school pickup waits for no man. You have got to be there to pick up your kid or to put your kid in or something. You will talk to strange men by telephone, text, or anything else at all hours, day and night, because stuff fails at all hours, day and night, and they will call you up. Um, your husband has to be pretty good about that because my husband woke up for years to hear me talking to some, somebody and uh, about what to do next. And he got so good, he could just roll over and go back to sleep. He didn't even, because remember the phone is in your bedroom so you can answer it at any hour. And for women engineers, you, there's still quite a bit of preconceived notions. But the truth is, as an engineer, you do not have to carry the damn bridge. You just have to design it properly. And, and it's very important to remember that because it is, um, it's just, a, a, you know, a, it, 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 your brains, brains work for everybody. They don't, they're not gender, they're, they're not gendered differently. Um, you just have to remember to design things properly and they can, you know, somebody else can do it. Now I, I brought this because we all have children and grandchildren and many of them are girls. You have to encourage your girls to think technically early Coding camps, robot competitions, very satisfying, incidentally, to build a robot to go over and smack that other robot really good. Um, a, lot of, a lot of robot competitions, they have them all the time. They're really fun. Rocket clubs. I used, when I was a kid, I belonged to several rocket clubs and we would shoot stuff off. And, and um, there are plenty, plenty of fun science activities that girls can get into that don't, you know, it's not gendered. Um, at my grandson's camp, they shoot off a rocket every morning. Why? I don't know, it's just interesting to do. They just shoot off a rocket every morning and then say good morning. Um, show, and I, the pictures I'm gonna show you should be shown to girls a lot because it is possible to have a good and interesting life in technology. Um, Joyce has, I have, many, many, many other women have had a wonderful time solving business problems and enjoying themselves. You saw the joy in that, in that uh, Mars landing thing. You could, you could spend three years of your life, but it's wonderful. And, you, and for yourself, you have to hire irrespective of gender. You know, if you have a business connection, you don't, you don't segregate the candidates, irrespective of gender, who can do the job. Here's, here's the women, uh, the, they were called computers, human computers in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, you can see here that they, they look like nice ladies, right? Nothing, but they are great mathematicians. Don't kid yourself. Every one of them is a great mathematician. They're called human computers. And this is, I have, and some of them have babies too. I might add that. I happen to notice just offhand that, you know, these human computers can also have babies and families and all the good things that everybody else has. This is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, in 1953, and this is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory last year. Look at the difference. And it's everybody, it's everybody. Um, could be, you know, 
and all these ladies are technologists and none, they don't look that unhappy either, but look how many they are. So that's, this is a goal, a goal. There aren't a lot of us women technologists. We'd like it to be more. Um, and in 2018, which, you know, it was only a couple of years ago, um, 24%, we'd like it to go to 39%. It probably won't. It'll be less than that. But it, because of COVID and a lot of other things. But we'd like to increase the participation of women in this rewarding um, technology work to, to maybe, you know, 35% whatever seems to be possible. And it's very possible today. So I am going to go back and end this. Anybody would like to add, ask a question? Um, I'm really curious about those, the early women who were real trailblazers in this. And it, it always fascinates me, any people who break out of a mold was there anything, any common background to these women that could have predicted that they were trailblazers, that they would not be happy with the norm, that they wanted to reach out and do something different? What encouraged these women to step outside the boundaries of the normal projected life? I don't know of any in particular, except, except the things you like and the things you don't like. And if there's something you like, you might find a way to do it. Maybe they were encouraged by their parents? I, I assume they all were, but, but I don't know that that's really true. I really don't know if it's true. It's, if there's one word that comes to mind for me, it's curiosity. It's just, you know, the innate curiosity of the, of the individual. And some people are, have a mathematical bent and some not, don't. Some like crossword puzzles, some prefer Sudoku. So there's a sort of natural bent it, that will guide you into it. But uh, certainly it, for some of those women in 1953, there were jobs available to do these mathematical calculations and only certain people would be drawn to that. Arnie, I think you had a question too. I was wondering, uh, when you went to computer school in the seventies, what were the what was the uh, program language? Basic, Fortran, or something else? Actually, I went twice because I'm a slow learner. Um, I learned it, originally they taught COBOL because that was the big business language in the early, in the, in the late seventies. I mean, right. most businesses were running COBOL ma machines with COBOL, unless they were scientific applications where you might need Fortran. About, I will tell you a story about 10 years later, computing is moving from these big, you know, big computers, massive computers to smaller desktop machines. And they don't work with COBOL. They, I mean, they probably could, but they don't. Um, they, they were using languages like C and uh, C plus and things like that, which was lovely, except I've been programming for 10 years in COBOL. So I decided being curious, I would go back to computer school and learn C and C plus. So I, I paid an incredible amount of money to go back to computer school. It really was very expensive. And I had kids at the time and I went to my first class and I knew nothing, nothing. It doesn't work the same way. I didn't understand anything the instructor said, anything at all. And I was very distraught. My husband was pretty distraught too, he signed the check. Um, so I did what any good person would do I called my son, who was a mathematics major in his sophomore year, and I said to him, you have to come home for Thanksgiving because I know you can do this and I cannot do it. 
And as a mother, I all know what you, and as a parent, well, you all know this, don't tell the kids. If they can do it, you can do it, right? I mean, pretty much if it's not physical, if they can think about it, you can think about it. So I figured if he could program in C, then he could help me with this class and he could teach me. So he came home with his laundry and his girlfriend. He put the, the laundry in the machine, sat on the couch, immediately called his girlfriend and grabbed my paper, you know, that I couldn't, with the programs I couldn't, I could not work. And, and while he was talking to the girlfriend, he, he did the whole thing in th about 35 minutes. He just said, here, this is this. I couldn't read his code. I couldn't figure out what he did. So I made him get off the phone. And I said, how did you get from here to there? In, and he talked to me for a few minutes and he realized I had nothing. I had no, none of his concepts were there. None, none concepts. So I said to him calmly, Michael, I have to learn to do this. You have to show me how to do it. Because remember, he'd grown up in a different, a different set of mathematical uh, teachings. He could, he could program. Of course he could. He learned in high school. So he, you have to teach me to do this. And he did what anybody would ask their children to do. He labeled everything in the house, pillows, chairs, doors, walls, windows, with mathematical concepts. And just like you would teach a kid to read, to read, you know, this is an elephant and you put the sign elephant on the elephant and this is a door and you write door on the door. He labeled everything. He labeled pillows, he labeled blocks, he labeled chairs. Then he, then he made little trains of chairs in the living room with pillows on them. And he showed me how all the math was moving from chair to chair to chair or pillow to pillow to pillow and sofa to pillow to chair. And by God, after you know spending three days with me labeling everything, I could do it. I could do it. You could do it. If you start thinking about it correctly, you can do it. And by the end, when he was ready to go back to school, I could be, I could pass that course because I was a C programmer by that point. So it's really, when Joyce would tell you the same thing. It's, it's really how you think about it. It's not specifics. You can look up the specifics. It's thinking about it correctly and the rest of it just comes. Barbara, I just, this is Arnie. I just want to say to you that, uh, I appreciate your presentation and your insight and your personal uh, stories. Uh, it was a pleasure hearing you today. Thank you. And Ari's the mathematician of the group. He, te <laughs> he teaches math. <laughs> and a magician too. <laughs> Barbara, um, I work at um, MIT for almost uh, 20 years, and your face looks very, very uh, familiar. W were you at MIT? I was not at MIT other than casually as a visitor. Okay. So I am very comfortable there, Alberta. I mean, you know, those people are thinking in similar ways. This is a fun. I love your anecdotes. I love your sense of humor, Barbara. It has just been a delight. Thank you so much for joining us today Thank and for you. the preparation. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was fun. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. Women of Brookline Rotary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. <laughs>